Good morning, Faith. Please stand with us as we praise the Lord this morning.
Jesus come and even so come Lord Jesus come there will be just to be with you this morning. If you're new here to faith, we really want to get to know you. We want to help you get to know us. And so if you're new, we'd ask you to just text the word visitor to the phone number you see on the screen, 518-535-3151, and uh, connect with us and help us to connect with you and get you as part of what's going on here, help you do that. Aaron, you have an Awana announcement for us, right? Come on up. Keep it a little calm because I have to go after you. <laughs> he loves it when I come up here. Good morning, church. I am not going to do this calm. I'm up here for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm here to announce how we did on Socktober, which was our service project for the month of October collecting socks. We collected 585 pairs of socks. <laughs> You people are amazing. One of my favorite things about this church is your generosity. And you really stepped up. That's over a thousand feet. So great. I'm really excited. I'm going to be bringing them to things of my very own tomorrow. And I cannot wait to see the looks on their faces. Second, did you realize that in a couple days, it's November? Wow. Okay, so we're moving on to our next service project. And I'm really excited about this one because it's new. We're gonna be partnering with Niski Now, which stands for Niski Yuna's Nutrition on the Weekend Program. And basically, it's like a weekend backpack program um, where they have designated about 80 children in the Niski Yuna School District 
that don't have access to food on the weekends. And I want that to just sink in for just a minute because Niskayuna is right next door to us. And there are children who may not have access to food on the weekends. And so they need this program to be able to eat. So when I spoke with the director to find out kind of how we could get involved, one thing they like to do for the holiday season is to send these kids home with cookie kits. We all like to decorate our Christmas cookies, right? And these kids don't necessarily have that opportunity. So we're going to be collecting three primary uh, food, food, I put that in quotes, food ingredients. <laughs> we're going to be collecting non-refrigerated cookie dough. It needs to be non-refrigerated. They do not have the access to be able to store it in a refrigerator. Uh, frosting and sprinkles. So think sugar, sugar, and sugar, because that makes for the perfect Christmas cookie. Um, another thing you could add to it if you wanted to is you could add spatulas or spoons or cookie cutters. All you cookie gurus, you know what goes in those cookie things. Um, you don't have to add, you don't have to bring in all this stuff. You could bring in just one thing. We're going to assemble the cookie kits here. So if you want to just add one thing to your grocery list, that's totally fine. Now, I know some of you are looking at me thinking, Erin, I just gave you a bunch of socks and socks are not cheap. And I understand that. So for those of you who just cannot add one more financial thing to your grocery list this month, I totally understand it. I have something for you. You're going to go out to your car. You're going to pop the trunk. You're going to look in there and you're going to assess exactly how many reusable grocery bags you have. Exactly. I knew I would get that response because if you're like me, you don't have just a few bags. You have bags of bags, right? Right. So you're going to take the bags that you really need to get rid of. This next step's really, really important. You're going to wash them because I know and you know exactly how gross they get sitting in our trunk. That's not required by Niski now. I call that courtesy. <laughs> so take your bags, clean them out, wash them, bring them all in as many as you need to get rid of. This is actually a really big need for Niski now because they need to send the kids home with bags with handles so that they can carry them home and they don't always come back. So they are in constant need of reusable grocery bags. So we have cookie kits, and we have reusable, gro reusable grocery bags, okay? For the whole month of November, I want to collect 80 kits. That's how many kids they serve. Thank you so much. We are really excited to be the church in the community, and we are literally serving our next door neighbors. So thank you for partnering with Awana and the Kids Ministry. Okay, now I'll try and match that. If I wave my hand off. We have a cornhole tournament coming up for men on the 12th of November from noon to 3 p.m. You don't have to play cornhole to come. Just come and hang out with us, have burgers, dogs. You know, we're going to just have all of that stuff hanging around. And so come, be with us, sign up out here, sign up online. But uh, just be part of what's going on, the men's whole corn, the cornhole tournament coming up on November 12th. So you'll, you'll get cards out here that will help you out. But be part of it. Get to know some of the other guys that are here. And let's walk this journey together. Faith Moms Play Group. They start November 3rd here on Thursday. So if, you've, if you're a young mom with young kids, you want to bring them out Thursday. They're going to start in the nurseries here. Um, that's their first location. Well, they're going to see who comes and what the ages are. But Thursday, 9-11, Faith Moms Play Group. Come on out and be part of that. You can invite friends, you can invite others to come from your neighborhood and just be part of what's going on there. Trunk or Treat happened yesterday and some pictures of that coming up here. And I heard the Comleys played the baby card and had a live baby for Christmas theme. And that they won the whole thing. So nice job, Comleys. But they had, had a great time yesterday. Thank you to all of you that be, were part of that and, and praying for that. Uh, what a great way to be rubbing shoulders with the people of our community and building bridges and, and relationship with them. So please continue to pray that we would uh, be able to follow up with the folks that came and engage them and build relationships with them. We have pathways this morning. If you are looking to, how do I become part of what's going on here? Ministries or membership, if you want to become a member here, we'd love for you to become members. We, we want, want to be in this together. And so today is our Belong 
workshop at 1030 in room CO2 out in the main hall. Come and check it out. It doesn't mean you're signing on the line. It just means you're investigating that. So come and be part of that this morning. Tom Bird, come on up here. He has an announcement for us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Good morning, everybody. Uh, two things this morning. Firstly, October is uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. And I would like to just acknowledge publicly our, our uh, love for our pastoral staff, for the dedication and service to this flock and all that they do. So if you have the opportunity this morning, please, Pastor John, Pastor Bob, uh, the other Pastor John, Paul Taddeo, Carrie and Catherine, please uh, let them know how much we appreciate their work in shepherding this flock. The second thing this morning, something, uh, an event this week I just want to share with everybody. This past Monday afternoon, uh, there was a, a special thing that happened to one of the members of our staff. When Pastor Kimmer came to us about two years ago and first interviewed with the elder board, one of the things he told us was that he was working on his doctoral uh, degree from Southern Baptist University. He had finished his coursework, but still remained his thesis and then the uh, oral uh, presentation he needed to make before a board of adjudicators. Well, I'm happy to announce that this past Monday afternoon, the end of the trail to get to his doctorate degree has happened. And Monday afternoon, Pastor Kimber successfully defended his thesis in front of the Board of Adjudicators and has been awarded his Doctor of Theology from Southern Baptist University. So please, a round of applause. There is one other thing that is requested. From his British heritage, there is a, uh, there is a specific way to approach a Reverend Doctor. So, gentlemen, as you approach the Reverend Doctor in the future, a slight bow from the waist. <laughs> and ladies, a gentle curtsy would be appreciated. So please, when you have the opportunity today, congratulate Dr. John Kimber. as we continue to worship this morning.
my vision, Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Heavenly Father. We come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord. Offer you praise in this place, Lord Jesus, today. We are your true sons and daughters, Lord. You've adopted us into your family, Lord Jesus, today. We're so grateful for that today. We're so grateful for the, the opportunity to be called sons and daughters of the living God. And today we come before you, O oh God, O oh Father, Abba Father. We ask that you would continue to lead us, continue to guide us about our way, Lord. And help us, Lord. And help us to walk worthy of your calling today, Lord Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Andy Lightcap, and I'm one of the elders here at Faith Baptist Church. Um, our scripture reading this morning is found in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. Uh, if you're using your pew Bible, that can be found on page 842. If you don't have a Bible, please take the pew Bible. That is our gift to you. We would love for you to take that and have that. Also a reminder at the end of the service, myself, some other elders, and a member of the women's prayer team will be up here for prayer. We would love to pray with you. Let's read uh, today's passage, Mark 7, 1 to 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not, in, not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. From what, for, for from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you love us, that you care for us, and you want a relationship with us. Father, we are, we are in awe that we get to come before you um, and be in your presence and worship you this morning, and we thank you for that privilege. Father, we thank you for an amazing day yesterday at the Trunk or Treat and the opportunity to be a light in the community. And I pray that people who were there for the first time, Lord, would, would be interested and would, would come to this church, and there'd be an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. Father, I pray that 
we would be a light for you in the darkness, that this church would be a lighthouse in the darkness, and many would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would be with Pastor John this morning as he shares uh, from your word. We ask, Lord, that you would give him clarity of mind, that the words from his mouth would be the words that you gave him. And I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, that we would leave with something new. I pray, Lord, that you would convict where we need conviction, that you would encourage where we need con- encouragement. And I pray that we would leave here today with a deeper love and understanding of who you are. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you to Andy and thank you to, uh, what was his name yesterday, Captain Hook and the worship team. Is that, it is Captain Hook, isn't it? If you weren't there yesterday, you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about and that means that you missed out. You should have been there. Um, if you check Facebook, you'll see some pictures of our worship director, Paul Taddeo, dressed as Captain Hook and he did not break character all afternoon, so it's nice to have him back again this morning. Uh, we are talking much about being the church in the community. I'm going to invite Joe Bova to join me. Um, I don't want this to put you off sharing stories with me about how you're engaging with the community, but sometimes this is what happens. Joe shared a story with me via email this week, and I'm straight back to Joe. Hey, Joe. And I'm like, this is a great story. Would you just come up here on Sunday morning and tell everybody? Now, Joe said yes, which is great. Uh, you really do not have to do that, okay? So I don't want this to put you off sending me, sending the office stories about how you're reaching the community. But this is a, a really great example of how we can be engaging in the community. And I really just wanted Joe to share with you this morning. So share with the, the congregation the way you did with me, Joe. Thank you. Good morning, church. So two weeks ago, a woman walked into my office and uh, she'd been a patient for three or four years. And when she came in, we just got talking like we normally do, and she mentioned how she couldn't uh, get to her gardens like she used to, and winter is coming, and she needed someone to come clean it up and just prepare it for her. So my heart, right, the Holy Spirit was really convicting me as I was talking to her. Uh, she, you know, Holy Spirit's like, Joe, do it. It's, it's you. You're the one that needs to do this. Well, my mind said, no. The first thought that came to mind, and maybe some of you husbands can appreciate this, was I have to check with my wife first. I don't know what's <laughs> going on Friday morning. That's my day off. Um, but as I was talking to her, the Holy Spirit got louder and louder, and I let her walk out the door. As soon as she walked out the door, I felt this panic. I felt like I couldn't do anything. I literally just stood there in my office, and I looked at my receptionist, I said, Eva, give me my phone, I have to, I have to contact her right now. So she's in her, in her car, in our parking lot, I contacted her, I said, Miss um, Pat, I'll be there Friday morning, I'll bring the boys, I'll bring my wife, and we'll get it done. She thanked me, and so we went on that Friday morning. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, as we're doing it, and, and working in the garden, my four-year-old just keeps looking at me, says, Dad, I love this. She said, we're making Miss Pat happy, right? I said, we are, Marco, we are making her very happy. Well, that was, again, two Fridays ago. I was in my office on Monday morning, and uh, my receptionist got a phone call from Ellis Hospital from a nurse, and she informed us that Miss Pat died uh, Monday morning. And so I, the first thought in my mind was like, oh my goodness, have I, have I done enough? Did I, did I share Jesus enough to her? Like, just all these different questions in my mind. And then after talking with my wife and and talking to pastor, the realization came that one of her last wishes was that the nurse contacted me. Like, who am I? I was a guy she saw maybe once a month best. And and so I guess I I leave it here saying, don't ignore the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You never know what he has in store, um, how you're gonna impact somebody. It it really, it's awesome what God can do through you, even when you're not trying. So, thank you. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Every opportunity we have to engage with someone is a divine appointment, and we have to believe that, and we need to take those opportunities to be engaging with people, ultimately for the the cause of Christ. Just the the display of love that the Bova family showed to, to that lady spoke to her. And that's what it means to be the church in the community. It doesn't mean you have to preach at people. It doesn't mean that you have to save people because newsflash, you can't save people. 
It's God who does that. But you need to be faithful to the Spirit's prompting in your life to serve God in such a way that people see Jesus in you. And ultimately, we know that God, the righteous judge, always does what is right. And so uh, we continue to serve him faithfully and we continue to be the church in the community. We'd love to hear your stories. Again, you do not have to stand here. We can play a video, or you can just send a story and I'll read it. Uh, but this is what being a family means. We, sh- we share with one another, we encourage one another, and we do what we are doing this morning together. We're continuing in the Gospel of Mark. Before we turn there, I uh, just want to read a little story to you. There was a teacher who was testing the children in the Sunday school. Uh, to see if they understood the concept of getting to heaven. Uh, She asked them, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale and gave all the money to the church, would that get me to heaven? No, the children answered. If I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? Again, the answer was no. Now she was smiling. They're getting it, she thought. Well then, if I was kind to animals and gave candy to all the children... I love my husband. Would that get me into heaven? Again, they all answered, no. She was just bursting with pride for them. Well, she continued, then how do I get to heaven? A five-year-old boy shouted, you got to be dead. (laughs) Now, that is true. Uh, This morning, we are going to learn from this next passage of scripture in Mark chapter 7 that you cannot earn your way to heaven. The only way to heaven is through a work in your heart that only God can do. And there is no amount of good works that can earn a place for you in heaven. That basically is what we're about to see. Just a recap from Mark chapter 1. It's been a couple of weeks since we were in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 begins with the outlaying of the reason for his writing, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And over the last six chapters, as we've looked at them, he has been substantiating that claim for us by showing us many things about this man, Jesus Christ. The religious leaders do not understand who he is. The crowd of people do not understand who he is. The disciples of Jesus, even at this point, still do not understand who he is. Even Jesus' own family members do not understand who Jesus is. And yet we've seen Jesus heal many people, free many people from demon possession. We've seen Jesus forgive sins. That really riled the religious leaders when he said that. We've seen Jesus challenge the religious leaders on the issue of fasting and the Sabbath. And we've seen him calm not one, but two storms. We've seen him raise a dead girl to life. We've seen Jesus feed maybe 15 to 20,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. We've seen Jesus walk on water. We've seen Jesus do many, many things. Mark is showing us these things so that we can only come to one conclusion. And that is... Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He is no ordinary man. No ordinary man can do these things. And what Jesus himself is going to teach us in these next verses is something now about about us and about our hearts. Not the thing that pumps blood through our bodies, but the center of what drives everything about who we are because it's, it's at the heart of a person that you find the definition of a person. It's a person's heart that defines them. So and verses 1 to 23 will be the verses that we are looking at, so keep those open before you as Andy read them to us. Before we look at these verses, let's pray. Father, speak to us now through your word. I pray that our hearts would be challenged, that our minds would be focused that we would hear your voice speaking to us as we consider these words from your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, passed down through the generations. May they have an impact in our lives today uh, in, in just the same way they did when those words were first spoken. So Father, have your way in our lives this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the world is broken. And whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you can see that things are just not right in the world today. Uh, The world is not as it should be. The world is not as it was when God created it. But what our culture tells us is that the problem with the world is due to someone else or something else. 
We're told that the reason that we have issues is not due to our own faults, but because of some external factor. And Jesus is going to teach us something completely contrary. He's going to teach us in these verses that the problem is not some external factor, but actually you. The problem is actually, is actually with, with us. What Jesus is saying in these verses is that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And in verse 1 of chapter 7, the Pharisees, they come to Jesus, these self-righteous, pious individuals, along with some scribes from Jerusalem, and they all gather together and they notice that Jesus' disciples are eating with unwashed hands. Now, just to clarify, that's not unwashed as in the disciples were dirty. Uh, They didn't wash their hands before they ate, which we know is good practice today. Maybe they didn't know that in those days. We're not talking about a simple washing of dirt off of the hands here. Uh, The Pharisees are disturbed about the fact that the disciples did not ceremonially clean, ceremonially wash their hands before eating. See, as far as the so-called religious men of the day, these Pharisees were concerned, there was a way, a correct way to wash your hands before you ate, and the disciples did not do it, and they noticed. And in verse 3, Mark says, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. You see, these religious people, these religious men, these religious leaders had uh, developed a specific type of hand washing that needed to take place before eating. Uh, Notice, interestingly, that Mark doesn't say that their system of hand washing is is a a good system of hand washing that's rooted in scripture. Uh, That's because it wasn't. The hand washing that they're talking about was rooted in tradition. And this tradition was established by men, by the elders, and it had been elevated to uh, scriptural levels to biblical proportions and as we read through the scripture we do not find any command to wash hands in this way before eating we do we do read about washing of hands a couple of times in the old testament the priests You know the way I love to use my hands like this, but never mind, I can, I can manage for now. Uh, we read of a, a washing in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 11, um, and we also read of washing that needed to take place when someone touched someone who was unclean. So there, there, are, there are a couple of washings that we do read of in Scripture, but, but not this type of washing that the Pharisees are talking about. It's because it's a man-made rule. It's a rule that was established by the elders. It had become a tradition and it had been elevated to a level of such importance that it almost, to them at least, became biblical, yet it wasn't. And, and in verse 4, Mark notes that they had become so rigid in their tradition that they would wash themselves after coming back from the marketplace in case they came into contact with a Samaritan. You remember how much Jews and Samaritans hated one another, right? Uh, Or bumped into a Gentile or touched something that defiled a person, uh, that a defiled person had touched. They'd become so caught up in this ceremonial washing that they even had specific laws for washing. Look what it says there, pots and pans and cups and dining couches. (laughs) It's interesting it says that, (laughs) dining couches. All this... All this stuff that they had to do, all this stuff that they had, they had introduced. You know, it's fine to have traditions. We all have our traditions. Uh, this is not a sermon against traditions. 
Uh, most traditions are, are fine. It's also fine to have certain convictions about certain things. But if those convictions are not rooted in Scripture, then whatever that thing might be should not be elevated to the level of Scripture. It should not be elevated to uh, biblical proportions. These, these men had elevated a man-made law to something that it should never have been to biblical proportions. You know, if you, if you have a tradition in your family or, or you have a custom um, that you have elevated to a level of such importance that actually if you, if you don't then do that thing, whatever it might be, you're somehow a lesser person, then, then you're a Pharisee. You're a legalist and, and you've allowed something to take a place in your life that it just should not have. Let's face it, um, we do fall into this trap from time to time. We have things in our lives beside God that are important to us, and that is okay as long as, firstly, they don't take the place of God in our lives. Okay, God has to be first, always. Agreed? God always has to be first. So we can have these traditions and customs as long as they don't take first place in our lives. But, But secondly... If this thing or, or things, whatever they might be, uh, become so important that you then, you then start to impose them on other people so that, that if these other people do these things, then they are as good as you. And if they don't do these things, then they're not as good as you. Then that's also wrong as well. Imposing your, your customs and your traditions on, on other people is, is wrong. Particularly if you are then going to look at them in a lesser way, if they are not abiding by those customs and those traditions. That's what these guys were doing. And in verse 5, all of this comes to a head. These religious leaders, they've had enough of, of Jesus with his blatant disregard for their laws and his disciples. And so, and so they say to Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? But, but eat with defiled hands. You see, these guys think that's what counts. These guys think that's what's important, that, that this is required for, for true righteousness, obedience to something which man created, the elders created. But God is after true worshippers, not hypocrites. He wants true followers. And these men were hypocrites, and we'll see why in a, in a few moments' time. The, the Pharisees and the scribes, they, they missed this. They thought that God wanted them to clean their hands, but they, they really wanted to do that to make themselves feel good. And all God really wanted was a clean heart. And so Jesus says to them in verse 6, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. What does he call them? Hypocrites. <clears throat> As it is written, this is a quote from Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Now we need to do some explanation. I need to give you some explanation here. We need to do some research here because I'm, I'm sure that most of you aren't just immediately familiar with Corbin, with that word there, and we do need to know something about that. But before we get there, these hypocrites have not only raised human traditions to the level of biblical truth, they have set to one side the command of God. In order to serve their own traditions and ultimately themselves. These men are more hypocritical than we realize right now. And when we start to understand more about this Corban, we will see why. In the Old Testament, first of all, of course, we know in Exodus 20, one of the Ten Commandments says, honor your mother and father. Okay, that's a command directly from God to everyone and still valid today. In Exodus 21 and verse 17, it actually says, whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. So it's a very important command, and that fact is repeated in this text. It's picked out from Exodus 20 and Exodus 21. And these religious hypocrites, after all they have just said about 
the disciples not washing their hands. They themselves are breaking one of the Ten Commandments. They are not caring for their parents. They are not caring for their fathers and their mothers. Worse than that, they are using something sacred as a reason to avoid obedience to this command, and through it, they are making dishonest gain. This is what needs to be explained. This is what you need to understand. If something is declared to be Corbin, if I can get this to come up on the screen. Technology is not my friend this morning. There we go. If something is declared to be Corbin, then it is a gift devoted to God. Corbin is, is a gift devoted to God. And these hypocrites, these Pharisees and these scribes, they were neglecting their parents. And they were neglecting their parents because of Corbin. Okay, follow me. Once something had been made Corbin, dedicated to God, it could not be taken back. And what these guys were doing is devoting everything that they had to God and actually neglecting their parents. So they're making everything that they had Corbin. You know, they want everybody to think they're, they're great people. These, these, these religious men want everybody to see how wonderful they are. So they, they devote everything that they have to God. They make it all Corbin. And once you give it to God, you can't take it back. And, and so what they have done in, in doing that is given everything that they have to God and they've neglected their parents. They've given nothing to their parents, nothing to their mother and nothing to their father. Now, as if that's not bad enough, what they had devoted... What they had dedicated to God, they then did not give to God. They, they kept it for themselves. And so they looked like righteous men, like they were giving everything to God, like they were making everything they had Corban. And then, and then actually, the way the Corban law worked, the neglecting of their mother and father is actually excusable because everything they have is devoted to God, even though it actually breaks an Old Testament commandment. And then, and then they... They don't give any of that which they've dedicated to God. They keep it all. You see how crooked these men are. They make themselves look like super righteous men. And yet they do it all for selfish gain. And these are the guys who are criticizing the disciples for not washing their hands. Really? The outward appearance. These, these righteous men, they, they look incredible. They devote everything they have to God. They neglect their parents. And then they keep it all for selfish gain. Wow. Jesus calls them out. And Jesus is going to say, you know what, guys, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And he gathers a crowd of people together and he says to them in verse 15, you know, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And then he leaves the crowd and he goes inside to a house where his disciples are. And they ask him about what he's just said. You see, these guys are still trying to work this all out themselves as well. And Jesus' reply is very direct. If you have the NIV in verse 18, it actually says, these are Jesus' words, Are you so dull? That's what Jesus says to his disciples. <laughs> I love it. Are you so dull? I can just imagine him saying it to them. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. A little bit of a biology lesson with his disciples. Mark comments in saying this, he declared all foods clean. And then Jesus goes on in verse 20 to explain more. He says, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For, for from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, Lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. That's quite a list, isn't it? What is Jesus saying? He is saying that our wickedness is not a result of anything external, that we cannot blame external things. 
our sin, our problems, our, our, our dysfunctions, they are not a result of bad company or bad examples or particular temptations or the snares of the devil. Our wickedness is a result of a wicked heart. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. In other words, it's what you are that defiles you, not what you bring into your life. It's what you are. It's your heart. It's your very identity. And unless our hearts are changed, then we carry within us a heart that is ready at any moment for any of those sins listed by Jesus in this text. And that's terrifying, isn't it? Let's be honest, though. At any particular moment of any, of any day, in the wrong situation with the, the wrong influences around us, any one of us is capable of committing these sins that Jesus lists. For from within, out of the heart of man, so, so it's not coming into man, but from man come evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and coveting and wickedness and deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within. And they defile a person. So we're not now talking about as the world does, things from without that, that come in and you, you say, well, I am the way I am because you know, this person had a terrible influence on me or this happened in my workplace or this is happening in my family or, or blaming all this external stuff for the way we are. Jesus says that's just completely wrong. You're the way you are because your heart's bad. It's coming from within and it's working its way out. And all of you by nature have a heart that is not right with the potential for any of these sins that Jesus here is outlining. And this is what makes the gospel so glorious. Because in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 it says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from what's the next word? All sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't matter what kind of a person we were before we became Christians. What matters is the sufficiency of Christ to change our sinful hearts and make them clean hearts. And that is called conversion. That is what Jesus does. When you repent of your sin and trust in him, your heart is changed. Your heart is made new. Your heart is cleansed. It's cleaned. It's, you're born again. You're saved. You have a, a clean slate. It doesn't matter who you are now, if you're not a Christian, or who you were before you became a Christian. It's God who changes your heart. You can't bring anything into your life to change your heart. It's only God who can do that work of change and transformation within you. And so this, this text of Scripture is, is wonderful and it's thrilling and it's remarkable because it's basically saying, you're, you're evil, you're sinful, but God is able. He can make you new. He can renew your heart. He can give you a, a heart of flesh that, that, that is, is, is new and renewed and living and changed and it's, you're a new creation. He can do it and we should never doubt the power of God to be able to do that in the life of anyone he chooses. God is able. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't give them seven ways to become a better person. He doesn't give them a list of things that they need to do and it's because he himself is on his way to doing what needs to be done in order for their hearts to be changed. He himself is doing it. He's on his way to Calvary. He is on his way to do what needed to be done in order to provide a solution for the heart that's wrong within them. Jesus would eventually go to the cross and he would eventually die and he would pay the penalty for sin. Three days later, he would be raised to life from the dead. Victory over sin, victory over death so that our hearts can be made new. And these are the verses in Ezekiel that talk about the heart of stone that we once had, which becomes a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, God says to his people, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Notice who's doing the action through every stage of that process. It's God. 
It's not you. It's God. It's God who makes a heart clean. You cannot make your heart clean. That is God's role. And he is not after church attendance. He's not after Bible reading. He's not after good behavior. He's after your heart this morning. He wants you to know him and he wants you to love him and he wants you to desire him above all else. One commentator writes, it must not content us to take our bodies to church if we leave our hearts at home. The eye of man may detect no flaw in our service. Our minister may look at us with approbation. Our neighbors may think us patterns of what a Christian ought to be. Our voice may be heard foremost in the praise and prayer, but it is all worse than nothing in God's sight if our hearts are far away. We are not perfect. And we will never be able to come to God with clean hands. But God is not after our perfection. He's after our hearts. And God can change your heart. God made it possible for you to have your heart changed through the death and resurrection of his perfect son. At this time in history, as Mark records, Jesus is on his way to do what was necessary for your heart to be changed. Tim Keller says this. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. I'll read that again. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope if you have repented of your sin then you have a new heart if you have never repented of your sin if you have never asked God to change your heart if you've never asked him to remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh then I encourage you to do that this morning while you feel the need because you can leave this building and and that thought's taken from you it's snatched from you you need to to commit your life to Jesus to repent of your sin so that your heart is is changed and transformed and made new if you are a Christian this morning you need to leave this place rejoicing that God has done that work in your life that he has renewed your heart, that your cold, hard heart of stone has become a heart of flesh, all because of the the, the transforming power of God by His Spirit in your life. If you leave this place this morning thinking that you can get to heaven by doing X, Y, and Z, then you're just one of these Pharisees. If you, if, you, if you leave here this morning believing that there are certain things that you need to do in order to, to be righteous beyond repenting of your sin and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and then working hard at sanctification, then you're one of these Pharisees. You have man-made laws that you've elevated to biblical proportions. It is not the external that impacts what defines you. It's the internal. It's who you are. It's what you have here here within, at the very core of your being. The, the only way to, to have that heart changed is God. And then through that, a home in heaven for all eternity. You see, the heart is the problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. So stop trying to be good enough to get to heaven. Admit that uh, you cannot ever be good enough to get to heaven. Commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ who died to make a new heart possible. And then you know for sure that you will be in heaven one day. It's a great promise for all who believe that there is a home in heaven when you commit your life to Jesus and have that heart change. So stop trying to be good enough. Stop with all the rules and additions. Commit to the primary fundamental truths of scripture that Jesus is God that he came and he lived and he died and he rose to buy my pardon and doesn't the hymn say an empty grave is there to prove my savior lives because today Jesus is alive and one day we're going to see Jesus face to face and I hope you're looking forward to that and I hope you believe that and it's only possible because God's done a heart 
transplant within you. You have a new heart. But maybe you don't. You need to ask God to change your heart today if you have not. And then rejoice in the awesome transformation that's taken place within. So we need to leave this place if we are saved and have had our hearts transformed, thrilled at that very fact and all that it means. And if not, seriously considering getting a heart transplant. And it's only God who can do that in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us not to be like these Pharisees, these legalists, these men who believed that traditions and laws would make them more righteous, more holy. Help us to believe and understand that there is only one way to have a heart transplant that we really desperately need, and that is to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved, to be made a new creation. Thank you that that Jesus made it possible. Thank you that as we read this text, he's on his way to do what was necessary to make it possible. That he would die, defeat sin, defeat death, the result of sin, in his resurrection from the dead. And grant heart transplants to all who believe in him. So help us not to get tangled up with all of the extras that sometimes we bring into our lives. Help us to stay true to the the pure good news of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand, elders, prayer partners, please make your way up. Let's sing this last verse of uh, Be Thou My Vision. High King of Heaven. Oh, High King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my God bless you. Go in peace. Have a wonderful day. Go and serve him today.